welcome to the Jericho Comedy Podcast. While we can't do our regular shows, we want to connect you with some of our great acts. I'm Connor McReynolds, and today I'm chatting to the wonderful Ben Pope. Ben is a superb writer and performer. He was president of the prestigious Cambridge Footlights, and he's one of the very best storytelling comics in the UK. If you've seen him at Jericho Comedy before, you know how great he is. I am really excited for you guys to get to know Ben a little bit better in this episode. We'll also be playing you a little something from our fantastic charity partner, Oxfordshire Mind. And later in the podcast, you get to hear Ben in action at Jericho Comedy, back in the times when we could all get together on a Saturday night. Right now, though, here he is, Mr. Ben Pope. Ben, hello. Thank you so much for joining me. Oh, thanks for having me, Connor. What a dream. Uh, how are you? Uh, yeah, I'm all right. I'm okay. I'm... Uh... I've just come back to London after um, uh, three months living on the south coast with my parents in lockdown. Um, oh, wow. So I'm feeling very overwhelmed and um, <laughs> uh, yeah. scared by all the fast moving vehicles and people. Um, yes, but I, I'm imagining it's kind of a proper yeah. case of sensory overload after being by a lovely peaceful coast. Oh, 100%. 100%. I'm, I'm like a new puppy being acclimatized to a house. It's like <laughs> it's freaking out about everything. Yeah, it's it's full on. <laughs> how, how was your time on the coast? Was it a, a kind of good opportunity for you to sort of center yourself and relax a little bit? Or um... uh, I mean, yes and no. It's very nice, it's nice to be in the countryside. That's always lovely. Uh, and, yeah, yeah. Being, and not, you know, as most comedians, I'm sure, uh, uh, who have, um, who you talked to have said you know there's no work at all so i have been um fairly yeah um freed up but i have uh but i was, I was also yeah i was looking after my parents i was doing a lot of gardening for them uh trying to sort of uh, summon my inner monty don um and <laughs> uh, uh yeah so i it, it's been it's been all right stressful in its own way but um different genre of stress uh, yes yeah it's kind of it's it's so weird isn't it that there are the kind of pros and cons because spending some time by the coast gardening in any other time sounds truly idyllic uh but as you mm. say when you couple it with a global pandemic and the collapse of our entire industry it, it sort of balances out a bit i suppose <laughs> yeah yeah there's a real um uh, yeah, it's it, it sort of feels a bit like fiddling while the roll Rome burns. Very much so. Yeah, all very lovely, but the, the entire world swimming to see. Um, Have you been able to? Because uh, I mean, I I've been seeing and, and casting very envious glances at all of these comedians who are using lockdown very productively to achieve a lot of things. Uh, and I am not Ugh. one of those people. Uh, are, are you in Ugh, my boat? Or... <laughs> uh, oh, I'm. I'm. <laughs> I am. Not only am I in your boat. I think I. I'm like the. I'm. I'm the running the 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 motor at the back. <laughs> that is. I. <laughs> I've absolutely. Um. I. I've done. I mean. I've done. You know. I. I once have done nothing. I have. You know. I kept writing stuff in in notebooks and diaries and whatnot, but yeah. I really, it feels. I mean, it does feel like just yelling, screaming into a void because it's it, it's the closest. You know what it is? It's the closest as I've been to being like a teenager again. Because not only did I move back in with my parents for a while, I was also writing jokes that I now you know <laughs> will possibly never be able to perform, which is pretty much how I, <laughs> I spent my entire teenager and trying to preparing to try and be a stand-up comedian with absolutely <laughs> zero outlet for that because. You can't be a fourteen-year-old who gets up on stage and pretends to have a life. Um, so <laughs> it, it, it was really, it was really weird. But um, yeah, no, I've, I've not, I've not, not created much. Uh, you know, I, I just, I, I, it's just, I find it very stressful. I haven't had the, um, I guess I haven't had the motivation. There hasn't been like a, I, I don't have a, my own podcast, or I don't have a, you know, a Twitch stream or anything. Um, yeah. So yeah. I. Um, Are you someone who kind of needs to have a a deadline or something to kind of work towards to motivate you? Yeah, 
Definitely. Oh, yeah. Or like, a, or, a, or, or at least a project I know is going to be created. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's always the problem I found with like, I love stand up because you can think of something that day and then go that evening and go and blast it out onto the onto the stage and put it in front of people. Whereas like, anytime I've tried to write scripts, you know, you could, it's, it, it's, the whole thing just seems like a suspension of, of, uh, of any actual re- realistic end of any end point to it because you just never know if it's ever gonna if it ever be made if it'll ever get put on somewhere so it does feel if like you to really fight you have to fight with reality on that one um whereas jokes you can just like well just like jokes you know so uh, jokes because they're often they feel like little they feel Feel like little gifts you know you don't often you don't the first idea for something just comes out of the middle of nowhere and then you can yeah. go and try it out that evening whereas with like scripts it always feels like every every little bit of it has to be hammered out like on it's just more like being a blacksmith than, <laughs> <laughs> um, than being a, a writer I like that. yeah you've you know? got to forge something out of fire yeah <laughs> um well, you've touched on a couple of things there ben that i'd really like to talk to you about the first is uh, you mentioned that you you wanted or you were thinking about stand up comedy as a teenager. Is is this something that you've always wanted to do? Mm. And, and if so, kind of what's your first memory of being funny? Um, well, I don't. Uh, it is something I've, I sort of always wanted. I know very clearly when it became something that I was like, I, I've, I've got to do that. I, when I was about 13, I started like acting in plays at school mm-hmm. and I was sort of so aware that I, it, it was like a complete surprise to me that I was any good at it. And I, and I, and I immediately loved performing and being in front of people doing stuff. And then when I was about 14, 15, I watched, I came home from school once and I watched a, um, uh, a Bill Bailey show that was on Channel Four, mm-hmm. and it was just such a kind of like light bulb moment to use the big you know cliche. It just it suddenly I was like, oh, this is amazing, and my brain was already like, oh, I can I can I can see how he's doing that, and I can unpick apart what's going on here, um, and I think I could do that. I think I you know, um, and so. I yeah I wanted to I wanted to get into that there and then I was sort of aware that I probably wasn't you know I had been funny in my life but I couldn't put a finger on like exactly when and yeah, exactly yeah. why so it became it almost became more like a kind of you know I know I can perform can I you know can I now study the the greats and see if I can make this you yeah know, can I can I can I sort of um retroactively like turn this performance gene into something uh, fun and funny um so i i just ended up like work watching loads of youtube videos yeah you mentioned studying the greats is that something that you kind of find yourself doing as a, a teenager watching comedians and sort of almost like analyzing the structure of jokes and that kind of thing yeah a little bit yeah i mean i was just i uh, i think I think it's hard to sort of studying it makes it sound really dry and dull. I was just obsessed with it. Like I thought it, I thought it was amazing. Yeah. And I thought it was incredible. And in that sort of in that way, when you're reading something amazing or you're watching like a film that you love and you, you like see someone in it and you're like, oh, that actor is amazing. And I want to I want to watch all of the films that they're in. Or um, yeah, yeah. or if you like really into sports and you're like, oh, that you know, uh, I want to follow that team now. It's the same sort of thing. It was like I. I, I I have like a deep <laughs> like need. I had a deep like need to go and watch all that stuff and uh, yeah. find and just in, like it was enjoyable, but in an almost in an academic way, like yeah, yeah, kind of fa- fascinating as well as fun. yeah. You mentioned Bill Bailey and and you watched that show and that was kind of your your light bulb moment. Um, but he's a uh, his style is kind of musical comedy and that kind of thing. Uh, were there any influences or any acts that you watched that you think really directly influenced your kind of comic persona or your your on stage style? Um, yeah, I guess so. I, I Bill Bailey. I would look back to that because I do think, like you know, obviously he's a musical comedian, and I don't, in terms of persona and stuff, I don't nothing like him really. But I do think, like the 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 spirit of his work is really exciting mm. because it's so kind of mag 
pie-ish, you know, it's stories and it's bits and it's, you know, musings and little ideas and, and, and also, it will, you know, given that it's quite weird for like the, that to be the first experience you have of stand-up, I think. Like most people, actually, I don't know if this is true of most people, but like, I think there's definitely a case of uh, classic stand-up being um, most people's way in. You know, you see a stand-up on TV and they're doing just like, you know, observational, classic observational stuff, you know, sort of Seinfeld-esque yeah. kind of thing. But but Bill Bailey, was, it was like so intelligent and it was kind of intelligent stupidity. And I always thought that was like, uh, uh, there was there was a real craft behind it and i think that that the spirit of that of being like curious and um trying to make something weird and silly but out of out of things that were genuinely very interesting that i kind of i like to think is the sort of the spirit i, I throw into stuff i mean in terms of persona i was i was really obsessed with dylan moran when i was um when i was a teenager as well i just thought he was the most like and again uh, not someone that i hugely um resemble in any way but i the, again the spirit of like uh, of the poetry of it all that that, that everything yeah. could be, be every word is really important and you can ring really interesting and still observational still like um deeply like uh, relatable material but you can ring it out of these really obscure angles and weird phrasings and um kind of yeah po poetry basically um uh and so, yeah and so i, I think th those two were like that was the sort of the kickoff point they are um, two fantastic influences to have i love that phrase that you used intelligent stupidity um yeah and i think is, is that something that you like an idea that you like to play with in your material kind of for anybody who's listening who hasn't had the good fortune of seeing you live what would be a kind of typical bit of Ben Pope material? Oh, what kind of things um, do you like to play with? Yeah, uh, I really like I like telling stories, but I like um, uh, what I the thing I try try to aim for is I try to take like quite um, relatable content, but approach it in quite a um, um, I suppose like a the cerebral way of getting to a joke. So I like s s in intelligent ideas expressed stupidly. I have a, a long bit about um, going to the gym and how it's sort of insane that we use treadmills because there, all you're doing there is essentially you're, you you've collapsed the spatial plane. You've you've reduced running down <laughs> to literally running on a spot and that being like a leisure activity like a guinea pig <laughs> and obviously the bit is considerably funnier than the way i'm expressing <laughs> it right there but like i think that's such a uh it's such an interesting idea that that is something that as like a society we've taken on as like a really good use of our time literally to run on the spot like <laughs> morons and i and i think like I, I then express that within like a longer rant about like how zoom is awful but taking something like that which is like i think there's like a fairly complex idea there and expressing it through like my own anger and sort of yeah. stupidity with it. I think it's, that's the way. And to be honest, I mean, I say that's, that's my particular view. That's all, a lot of comedians ways of expressing themselves. I think is you take a, a concept or a nugget of something that's actually quite hard to unpack and you express it in a very like simple, um, uh, kind of, uh, yeah. everyday way. And it takes something quite kind of, bulky potentially and, and makes it immediately accessible and yeah uh, yeah like laughable you know um, but i've made this all sound very dry you mentioned the word anger in there but that isn't necessarily a, a quality that i would associate with your comedy but perhaps uh it's maybe there's anger in the idea but very much not in the delivery because it's a very charming uh friendly delivery i think quite calm oh well that's that's kind i mean yeah i, th I think i i yeah anger is probably the wrong word okay occasionally i have little um sort of flurries of i think uh anger is the wrong word bemusement or um um 
I guess, mild, kind of in the in the mode of like David Mitchell getting incredibly het up about something very small. Um, I suppose yes, like absolutely. That, that kind, kind of inconsequential of thing. things that become huge. Yes. Um, yeah, absolutely. That's well, you you mentioned, mentioned David well. Mitchell there, and and that mm. kind of leads me on to a question about your your position uh, as president of the Cambridge Footlights. I mean, that mm. for so many people, uh, the Cambridge Footlights are kind of the the stepping stone into comedy. Um, I, I mean, there are co- comedians like Sarah Pascoe who applied to Cambridge solely to be a part of that group. Was yeah. that a part of your thinking when you when you applied to Cambridge? Was was the Footlights always something that you wanted to be a part of? Yeah, honestly, des- like desperately. Yeah, it was. That was a large. <laughs> I, I had sort of. <laughs> I was very like nerdy academic teenager, so I, I was sort of had it in my sights anyway because I was you know. Um, interested in it as a, an institution and I wanted, you know, anyone who wants to go to university is keen to go to a good a good uni, but, I, but I, I was very, particularly by the time I was about to leave school, I was very, very excited about doing, like, theatre and comedy and I knew that it was a really you know, you go into it knowing that there's uh, a bit of a legacy there and there's a bit of, you know, there are people, it's, it's a good route in, and particularly, you know, um, as a comedy, which is such an unstable career, and it's such a, a, a strange, seemingly um, you know open-ended. It, it seems like almost impossibly challenging when you've not done it. But also, it, it's so open. You know, anyone could apply to do an open spot or whatever. I think I, I think yeah. I saw doing um, university comedy as as a kind of uh, as one as a like a sheer a fairly secure route of like just one way of preparing myself in order to try and attempt a career in comedy um it looked like a good routine um which you know what i i would say it, it is in some ways and it is isn't in others i think um there's been a lot of chat recently um a lot of discussion in the like the comedy industry about you know privilege of various sorts and and i think um, people have rightly criticised the fact that, you know, as with pretty much all industries, like, you know, if someone's been to Oxbridge, there is an enormous amount of um, privilege that you get. And it's certainly something that has I've noticed mm. that lots of people have noticed is that, you know, if you do, often people who've gone to the footlights have, you know, often either leapfrogged or gone straight into stuff like TV and um, and film and that kind of thing. And it seemed almost, you know, that all comes down to like contacts and people you meet at that level. Um, and that yeah, is a bit of yeah. an unfair advantage. But what I don't think it prepares you for fully is actually the reality of the live circuit. Um, is it makes you very sure in your own abilities, but doesn't prepare you for hecklers or, um, you know. Yeah, that's though. interesting. Yeah, when I was chatting to Mickey Overman in last week's episode, uh, she talked about how her first ever gig uh, was after completing a comedy course and how the, the audience there were all just sort of friends and family of the people who had done the course. And so it was just the nicest audience in the world. And I had that experience as well. And I would imagine mm. that the kind of Cambridge Footlights audience are all kind of uh, friends or admirers of the group. And yeah, so how was that transition for you? What were the kind of harshest lessons you learned going from that environment into sort of open mics and and gigs around London and that kind of thing? Well, it's it's uh, it, it is a there's a real gear change, and you, um, I think on one hand it's it's very good, and in the same way with that comedy course audience, right? That serves a really a good purpose, which is to give you some confidence. You can't yeah. do comedy without a certain level of confidence, and you need to know that you're, you know, you need to believe in yourself enough to get over the first hurdle, which is getting up on stage and having a go, right? And and that's why you know student comedy is very supportive, and it's why those comedy courses are so supportive because it gives you it gives you like a, a free pass to try. Um, which you don't get in if you went in straight and you did like an open spot at a comedy club um or, or an open mic right you you go yeah. in very 
it's a harsh reality and particularly open mics particularly in this country are a fairly b brutal you know <laughs> vacuum sealed environment right it certainly can um, be. so I, I definitely yeah i at that first particularly i'll tell you what the first year out of university i was very lucky um to go to the fringe the year afterwards and i did uh, i split an hour with uh, an excellent comedian called Chris MacArthur Boyd, who's Scottish and who is genuinely just a wonderful uh, comedian, and he's like a really good friend. He's like he's 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 such a he he straddles the line between being an excellent um, club comic and then also is like uh, has loads of really interesting anecdotal cerebral material as well. So he's like a really he's oh, got wow. like a star written all over him. Um, but he I, I did I split an hour with him and it was such a it was such a learning curve because he who had like built up five, 10, 20 minutes very slowly on like the Scottish circuit, which is considerably tougher. And I had come in with all of my misplaced confidence, assuming that I could <laughs> deal with a uh, a middle-aged Scottish audience <laughs> and it and I I died like every <laughs> night for not every night yeah. but most nights for a month and it really was it it really taught me to just go back to basics and build up five minutes and build up 10 minutes and to do it like from the base upwards that's so interesting was there uh and not to just assume that you can get by on charisma. Yeah. was there a point during that run um, when it it wasn't yeah. feeling so good when you were kind of going up not getting the reaction you wanted did you ever doubt yourself or yeah 100 percent. i mean you go into that feeling like uh very unsure of i i i i i the first night i remember being it, it was it dread I was it was dreadful and I and you know I picked it up by the end we picked it up by the end of the run Chris was like reliably very good uh particularly on the weekends when there was a fuller crowd and I I remember getting by the end of the you know I was recording kind of record my sets so I should look, listen back to them and I couldn't bring myself to do it the next day because I couldn't bear to listen <laughs> to me doing the same material and it just being and hearing the confidence drain out of out of my no, um, no. voice and and it really which sounds it sounds terrific and it is but <laughs> I, but it was like a really good um uh it was a good lesson in just um well, a like learning about the broadness of of the circuit, and that you're not even there. Like we were in like a theatery room, but we were getting you know gilded balloon audiences, which I'd say is probably a clubbier audience than most mm -hmm. of the rest of the fringe uh, audience. And and it was you know it was a fairly safe space, but I was still struggling. And I and I think it was a really good lesson in how to serve the audience that you're being dealt you know and that is what makes a, a, a really good comedian uh, uh and i won't say that i'm i'm that even i don't even know that i i have the full breadth of experience that i i could have at this uh, this point in my career um but like what makes a really good comedian is someone who can play an audience that they get given and sometimes it's not easy um and i uh, yeah, I, I had to learn that the hard way, and it made me sit back and to a look at the material that I had and work it harder, and also it made me retreat a little bit from. Uh, it made me throw myself into tougher gigs, yeah. but also remember that you know that there was stuff that I loved, the stuff that I loved doing, and some of it wasn't working with this particular audience, but that didn't mean that it wasn't good and that it wouldn't serve someone. But it was just learning how to present the right stuff to the right people you know if you have a very vulnerable story and you, you don't want to throw that at a you know at a at a saturday night glee club yeah. crowd you save that for uh, the vegan cafe gig, right <laughs> but um 
you know, if you have 10 minutes of, of sex escapade stories and one liners, then obviously that's going to work better in certain, and you just learn to, yeah. to deal with those different audiences. Better. It's so interesting having but again, that. I won't say that I'm. Well, well let me say it for you. I, you are wonderful. And every time <laughs> you've come to Jericho Comedy, you've always pitched the gig just right. And you mentioned those kind of sort of vegan cafe type gigs. I, th- I think Jericho probably falls into that category a little bit you you've got that experience of having performed for cambridge audiences and you've come to oxford a lot uh, am i artificially kind of manufacturing uh, a sort of similarity between those crowds or does oxford feel like a different type of gig to some of the london ones you do oh definitely it is i think it is it is very different uh, i mean you know i <laughs> when you say it's in the vegan cafe <laughs> sort of wheelhouse uh it is in some ways <laughs> for sure um but equally you know i i you know you've got i don't know how many gigs you have running now in, in central oxford but um uh you know i've done the the bottom of the jericho cafe sometimes when it has been like you know we've had all sorts of um uh there's been a lot more like audience um interaction than uh than at a, a very like pristine theater gig you know it's been it, it has it has a nice range you do get a mixture of students and you get a mixture of, of people from the town right who've come for a night out who you know could have gone to you know another one of the clubs in oxford so you do you do get a, a really um it, it's why i like to come and play with you guys is because it's such a uh it's very useful it's a kind audience but it's they also they won't they won't suffer fools it's not it's not gonna it's not always gonna be a walk in the park so yeah. it's a good place to like you know um try stuff out and and uh, and yeah it's um, still a saturday night and people want a good time so you've got to, right, got exactly. to satisfy the audience yeah. but as you say they they are generally Absolutely. so lovely um and and will be very patient with people you know we we do try to give your performers a chance or maybe taking their first steps into comedy and then people like yourself who are uh, very much more kind of polished and, and really confident in their voice so yeah it's uh, I feel very lucky to be associated with Jericho because I just love it as a club I think I'm a bit spoiled because mm. the majority of the gigs I do are there so I have this idea of comedy that it's every gig is that nice and then you go <laughs> somewhere else and realize oh no Jericho's quite special. Sure, sure. Um, well, Ben, this this is great. I mean, thank you so much for for all of that. I I could keep talking to you all day, but uh, right now I've got to go to a little clip from our brilliant charity partner, Oxfordshire Mind. Here they are. The outbreak of coronavirus is affecting all of our lives in lots of different ways, and in these uncertain times, we are seeing a surge in demand for our services. Last month, we had a 390% increase in crisis calls to our information line and a 117% increase in calls to our benefits advice service, supporting people in financial need to claim the benefits they are entitled to. We are still here for you, your friends, colleagues and communities. Our services are still running, albeit in a different way, but we need your support to help us continue. Please make a donation to Oxfordshire Mind so we can continue to make sure anyone with a mental health problem has somewhere to turn for advice and support. You can donate via our website at oxfordshiremind.org.uk and you can also find free and fun, exciting ways to fundraise for the team via virtual fundraising ideas. Okay, Ben, this is the point in the podcast where I stop being friendly and instead I become very serious and demanding. I'm going to be asking you a series of challenging, provocative questions here, and all I need from you are some honest answers. Can you do that? I, I'm I'm scared, but I'm prepared. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> that should be the name of the section, scared but prepared. Uh, right, let's go into this. Ben, do you think that the English language would be better or worse if we gendered objects like some other European nations? Oh, as in like having le or la. Absolutely, or, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, well, um, I no, I don't think it would. I think it's, it's deeply, you know, we live in a, a, a very exciting times when gender is more fluid than ever. I can't imagine that it would make anything more 
um, confusing than to suddenly <laughs> have to work out whether or not a table had a penis or not, or whether that even mattered. It's, I mean, do you know what I mean? It's, I do. I, <laughs> we've all got enough on our plates already. Um, <laughs> And those plates themselves don't need to be jumped. So <laughs> I, I'm saying no. It's a strong no for me. <laughs> I think that is a very sensible answer. Ben, how much cheese would a friend have to eat before you staged an intervention? Um, I think that... Uh, I'm an, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it's an infinite amount. I really like cheese. Uh -huh. So if anyone was going to go on full out on a kind of grand boeuf style uh like suicide cheese pact <laughs> i would probably join them i i would very enable this um cheese death so death by cheese sounds wonderful doesn't it doesn't it It'd be a smelly death it would be yeah, <laughs> yeah but not your problem uh ben who in your opinion is the best muppet and why Oh, huge question. Uh, these really are pressing questions, actually. Um, um, I'm a big fan of, um, you know what? I really like the little one. I can't remember his name. His name's like Scooter or something. Who? Oh, yeah, um, the director. Who, yeah, who has the little glasses and the little... He, I think that is... Um, he, he seems to deal with all of the bullshit, you know? Um, <laughs> <laughs> everyone else seems to just faff around and he's the one pulling the strings together and then kermit gets all of the all of the reward all of the like the kudos for that i'm yes. I'm, I'm very pro scooter also for a more niche answer um i used to be really uh, as a kid i used to be really obsessed with the 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 short-lived 90s muppets show which was called muppets tonight yeah it was like a kind of late night talk show thing right and i used to love Clifford, who was like the presenter of that, who was especially invented. Wasn't he great? He was like funny. And... A, a kind of uh, Caribbean. Yeah, Muppet. I mean, we don't need the racial politics to it. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. He yeah. arrived around the same time as Pepe yeah. the Prawn. I don't know if you remember Pepe. Yes, Pepe was a classic. Pepe was lovely. Two yeah. wonderful Muppets. All right, Ben, can you name for me three marsupials? Uh, possibly no. Um, <laughs> a kangaroo is one. That's one. Yeah. Uh, a wombat is a wombat a marsupial. Yes, a wombat is, is a marsupial. It, okay, we're nearly there. Wombat uh, and a koala. I'm going to go koala. Oh, that was very well played, Ben. You nailed that. Nice. You just got to go to Australia. That's it. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. They all live in Australia. Only... Yeah. Just Australian people probably will get you half a point. I yes. don't know if, if you are kind of Absolutely. technically half marsupial if you're from Australia, but why not? Uh, Jericho Comedy would like to disassociate itself from this host's racism. Uh, ben, question <laughs> five. Have you ever done the thing where you inhale helium from a balloon to make your voice go squeaky? I have, yes, um, with great results. Um, <laughs> uh, in fact, I, <laughs> it's, it's a huge joy. There's the, I mean, the, one of the greatest scenes in all of sitcom history is the scene in, um, I don't know if you've ever watched New Girl, which is the one with Zoe oh, Dash yes, in it, yes. where they're all, they're all doing helium in the flat, and then Nick Miller comes back in with news that his dad has died and they all have to <laughs> console him, but they've all got healing in them. That's a great scene. Great scene. It's a really um, great scene. I'd forgotten about that. Yeah. <laughs> That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, ben, what colour is your toothbrush? Um, currently, you know what? I've had a, a very new and exciting development and I've gone from acoustic to electric recently <gasps> um, on the... Uh, yeah, I know, on the opinion of my dentist and uh, family. So I'm now, it's fully like white, maybe some blue stripes on there. Oh, wow. And um, it's so exciting. It's very, the first time I used it, I I was worried I was going to like drill through my face or something. It's very, <laughs> it's a very intense experience. Oh, wow. It's like giving your teeth a massage. It's great. Would, would you recommend it for our listeners? Um, yeah, if they're into that kind of thing, then yeah, great. 
Extraordinary. I, I recently uh, went to a bamboo toothbrush. Uh, to oh. Do, because I, I read one of those horrifying facts where on Twitter where uh, I think it must have been Greenpeace or someone said every toothbrush you've ever owned still exists somewhere in the world. And that just made me think, like, mm. oh, God, that's awful. So, yeah, bamboo toothbrush. Um, but if they start making electric bamboo toothbrushes, that's the dream. Well, is it? I don't, because you see, you've made me look like an arsehole now, because <laughs> I've said, you know, oh, yeah, plug it in the wall, <laughs> carbon all the way. And now you went for the greener option. That's a, oh, uh, well that, that was a real that's bit great. of gotcha Actually, journalism to... there. Yeah, that was. That was yeah, unfriendly yeah. and I mean, unnecessary. This, this, this <laughs> just trap. <laughs> well, Ben, on a different subject, what's the secret to really great scrambled eggs? Um, you know what? It's again, this is all about reading your audience. You've got to ask them whether you want them what whether people want them wet or dry. You know, old people like dry eggs. And that is, you know. You've got to, yeah, you've got to really overcook them if they're over 60. But for everyone else, it's, it's, uh, it's all about the accessories, right? Cook them quickly in a little wok with um, uh, pepper, uh, diced chorizo, oh. um, and a little, maybe a little bit of spinach on the side. And then, oh, and buttery toast, and then we're done. I think I'm, I'm, I've come up with an answer quite quickly on this one because I'm very hungry. <laughs> so that's, <laughs> that is uh, not just a an good answer. answer. That is a truly great answer. You sound like a man who knows your way around an egg. I know my way around an egg and no other foods. I'm a dreadful cook, but I can do brunch. <laughs> brunch is the one thing I can do. That's like it. Cause it's easy. It's all just, it's all just eggs and eggs and bread. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, oh, that's fantastic. Well done you. Uh, ben, if you had to come up with the next big crisp flavor, what would it be? Oh, that's hard. Um, well, it's just, it's tough, isn't it? Because they've they've tried loads of things now, and lots of them have been. Do you remember when they did try to do tomato ketchup? Roughly in the, the early two yeah. thousands. Yeah, yeah. So they kind of a bit disappointing. Um, something like, ooh. Um, this is like a kind of this is like a dating app question. I they always look. This is it's like it's, it's truly dumping. Um, uh, maybe something like some kind of curry that they haven't done before. So like instead of you know Thai, I feel like a lot of Thai curry crisps. Maybe like a kind mm. of um, or like Vietnamese cuisine or something. Maybe they could do like a pho crisp. Although that I don't know what that would be quite watery it might be <laughs> horrible um as i'm saying it i'm just like this is disgusting what have i done um uh oh, but you know what they could do a full english couldn't they imagine if they could do like a willy wonka style full english you <gasps> like know when he has time that release berries or whatever thing. yeah there's a great popcorn company that i don't know how they do it but they've got uh like three or four flavors in there and it really is willy wonka-esque uh, the one I tried, I think, was like caramel and chili or something. And you put it in and you get the really kind of sweet caramel hit oh. straight away. And then after a little second, you start to get the kind of the chili hit. But they work so well together. I don't know how they do it. They're, they're wizards. They really are. It's like a science. It's a... Oh, yeah. Science is probably the answer rather than magic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Almost certainly, yeah. I was going to put all their effort into... <laughs> You know, curing one of the many diseases in the world rather than inventing time release flavors <laughs> on popcorn. But there we go. I'm assuming the popcorn industry has now shifted their focus into finding a vaccine. But yeah. here's hoping they get done with that quickly because I really want some more popcorn. When, when they do have a vaccine, it will have a, a, a chili release. <laughs> the, uh, 10 seconds. It's going to taste and delicious. Stuff. Ben, my final question for you is, is there anything that Meryl Streep can't do? Um, I don't know her personally, sure. so I can't answer that question <laughs> to the best of my ability. Um, she probably... Um, mm, no, I'm going to say no. I feel like she's quite a capable lady. Yeah. 
she must be very rich now. So there's, you know, she's got she's got facilities at her disposal. <laughs> yeah, that's um, true. Um, she could use all those awards and stack them, melt them down, and turn them into a an even bigger award. I don't, <laughs> I don't know what she does with. I love that idea that she just makes herself one huge Oscar. That's really fun. <laughs> Well, there we go. Uh, now, we love nothing more than being in front of our brilliant audiences, introducing you to wonderful acts like Ben. And it feels like a lifetime since we've done that. So to remind us all what that experience sounded like, here's a clip from a live Jericho comedy show featuring none other than our guest this evening, Mr. Ben Pope. Check it out. Uh, I'm a late person, um, as in I'm late and stuff, I'm not dead. Uh, just to clarify that sometimes, because it's weird, isn't it, when we refer to dead people, we're like, oh, the, the late, the late John Smith. <laughs> it's like, dude, he's not coming. Which I feel good to count, but he's not going to watch it I know, but I am, I am like late for everything. I'm like, I just, I was born late, and I think that set the tone. Uh, I was born ten days late, which is like, that's late, isn't it? That's ten days. And in any other context, that counts as not turning up. That's, <laughs> that's, that's what I mean. Ten days late for a business meeting, they cancelled the search party. That's not happening anymore. I, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, anyone else here a late person? Give me a yell. What? Who, who was that? Was that? Oh, you're you just getting involved because you want to. <laughs> that's a yes, yeah. <laughs> what are you, are you there? Are you late for stuff all the time? Just late. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you find, do you like it? It's fine. Is it? Because I find it exhausting. Why be early? Why be early? Why? Well, that's my feeling. Who here's an early person? Yeah. Yes, polite hands. That's the real divide in the country. That's the, uh, <laughs> that's why you guys hate us. Oh boy. Then, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the hostility. I can feel it. It's, it's radiating off you. Um, no, it's I. I I, look, I would never say anything against you, early nerds. But I, what I, I know. I just I find it amazing because my body just doesn't. All I have lots of friends who are like you are like punctual for stuff. And they're always really hostile, they're like Shakespearean about it. They'll always just be like, don't you, do, do you not care that you waste our time? And I'm always like, no. But, <laughs> but that's not the reason I'm late. The reason I'm late is because I just, I don't mind my body's like measure time in the same way. Like it just doesn't like, you know, like if someone says, we all bet you've got five minutes to leave the house. My brain is like, oh great, time for a bath and pasta. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, it's so difficult. Also, there's like more romance in being late for stuff. Like, you know, early people get the train, and like, more often than not, not always, but it's like, you know, they, it's on time, or they tell you when it's coming, and then, you know, if they, they, it's not on time, then they tell you why. Whereas buses, which is what I take. Oh, buses. Mm -mm. It's just measureless, indeterminate waste of time. Oh, I love it. Waiting for a bus is like waiting for a lover to return from a war. You just. <laughs> They're just like, oh, I know he's coming. Oh, I don't know when, but I'll know it when I see him. Like, that's just, oh, glowing 37 on his forehead. Like, that's, you know, just, I find that I love that. You know. um, pu uh, punctual people, what's your name, Alex? No, that's right. You don't have to if you don't want to. <laughs> That was, we heard the inside thoughts there for a second, didn't we? You, you guys were, you, the, you, this whole row was punctual people. You're capable of telling the time. What a what a slight burn. That was so <laughs> No, no, thank you. No, right. I deserve we're also, it. We're also parents. You're also parents and you have to be at that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. No, that's fair enough. I've not given birth to anything. Um, so I don't know. I don't understand. Do you make um, do you make packed lunches? Well, you must do because you're parents. For me? No, no, no. I'm not asking for one right now. <laughs> <laughs> that would be so nice. Mother? <laughs> That's not nice. That's, when you were like, we're parents, they're not my parents, by the way. <laughs> this is, this is, this, yeah. No, the, the, the reason I, just, I bring it up is, uh, it's, I, I, don't find, I find it fascinating how everyone sort of thinks differently in that way. I used to wear a watch to try and deal with it. Um, but I just, it never made me on time, it just made me angry with my wrists. That was all, uh, I was never, I was never like pleasantly surprised. I was never like, oh, it was always like, ah, fuck, just all the time. I might as well have a wristband that said, oops, like there was no point in anything. Do you know what I mean? That's what a watch is, it's pedantic jewelry, isn't it? It's like passive aggressive slap band that you have to wear around your, it's an anal bracelet, well, that's something else, but I, I um, no, the, I mean, the reason, yeah, the reason I bring it up is, uh, my dad is a very punctual person. Uh, he was a 
a teacher for his whole life. So he had like one job his whole life, so he had like lots of you know, time around that to sort of you know, uh, work out his skills and do, you know, work out what his hobbies were. He's a more rounded human being than I am. Like, my dad likes The Clash, and he can bleed a radiator. Um, <laughs> whereas like, I like Discover Weekly, and I don't know what blood type radiators are. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> There's a thing there, you know, that I don't, he can drive like a lorry, he can drive like a minibus and like a coach, and he's got like a, I have a provisional driving license. <laughs> And I'm 26. A provisional. Hey, anyone else under any other provisionals in? Yeah, a couple. Yes, yeah, isn't it? It's the, how old are you? Do you, do you mind me asking? 23. You're 23. Okay, that's marginally less embarrassing. <laughs> um, um, that's, but that's fine. I, I just find it because it's like, it's, I think it's the most useless piece of card you can own. It gets you alcohol, which is like not the point of driving. <laughs> do you know what I mean? <laughs> that's the whole, it's so ridiculous. Because it's like essentially, like a provisional driving license is a piece of card that says, I can drive if I learn to drive, which is, <laughs> what a big proviso that is. That's a big if. Like that's, you know, essentially it's a laminated piece of hope that I carry around in my wallet. <laughs> Police officer's like, can you drive? I'm like, one day. Oh, that's so, so ridiculous. My dad, my dad is awesome. He, he was like born in the country, so he has all those skills as well. Like he can hear bird song and he can tell you what bird that is. <laughs> he's Shazam. He's, <laughs> he's Springwatch Shazam. <laughs> he can hear like Macaw, and he'd be like, "Ah, oh, the lower beaked tumble tits." And he's like, <laughs> "I don't know the birds." Okay, but <laughs> I don't have that skill and that superpower at all. I well, I know with one thing: if I hear a certain frequency of beep, uh, I can tell you that my lasagna is ready. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's not enough. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you seem like an intelligent, composed gentleman, <laughs> but I want to put that to the test in a little game called What If. So I'm going to give you a hypothetical scenario, and I want to hear how you would react. Does that sound good? Of course, yeah. Fantastic. Okay, so Ben, you're sat in a comfortable chair in your home, having a generally lovely time, when suddenly the door to the room bursts open and you walk through the door. You say that you've come from the future to take you with them as you're the only person who can save the world. I mean, first of all, what are your thoughts on that? I, I'm so excited. I love a sci-fi. I am desperate to know what I look like, <laughs> like I, from other angles other than mirrors. I want to know, you know, it'd be so exciting to see my behavior up close. Um and then also, yeah, a chance to be a narcissistic hero. I'm very, I'm, I'm so, I'm so up for this. Oh, that's great. Some people may respond with trepidation, but not you. You're, you're just delighted to see yourself. Yeah. Do you think future you would be happy to see past you as well? I mean, he'd probably be uh, d disappointed to see how much time I was spending in my pajamas, but. <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure I'm, yeah, I, I, you know, hopefully we'd get along. I think it'd be sad if I didn't get along with myself. Unless I'd gone through an extraordinary, you know, transition of character in the next, you know, five, ten years. Or yeah, whatever yeah. I mean, it um, sounds like future you is kind of all business. They sort of burst through the door and say that you're the only one who can save the yeah. world. What, what kind of problem do you think there is in the future that your skill set is needed uh, and that only you can do it i daren't imagine like i <laughs> it would be a so what an, or what horrible awful thing has happened and what also what horrible thing has happened that has presumably wiped out all of the other mediocre like <laughs> white, like slubby dudes. Um, that means that I'm the only one left who could possibly do <laughs> that. Who could possibly save the world? It'd have to be some kind of like crisp eating contest, or um, <laughs> you know, a, a, a key or a bomb or something can only be unlocked if you are good at doing, you know, easy sudokus. <laughs> I can't imagine. Well, Ben, it, it sounds like you're you're well up for going with this future you. They kind of say, "Come with me. Mm. You got to save the world. No questions asked. You're going with them." Yeah. 
Mm. Yeah, I think so. I <laughs> I don't know if I'm that excited about my life in the current period that I wouldn't throw it all away for a fun <laughs> adventure. I, 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 I want to I want to time travel. This is yeah. <laughs> Do you bring anything with you, kind of from the present into the future? Do you think there's anything at your disposal that you think might be useful, or you just don't want to risk losing? Um... I think I might I might bring like um, maybe it'd be worth bringing like uh, some books or something just in case they have like in the future some horrible technological thing has meant that you know no one reads books anymore or um, or they think it's like outdated technology or something that would be cool or if they were like space Nazis who burnt all the books or something I don't know. <laughs> Um, I feel like, oh my god, that's a Hollywood yeah. B movie waiting to be written, and only you can write yeah. that movie, Ben. Space Nazis. That's what they need me for. They need me to write <laughs> Space Nazis Five, um, in which I provide lots of like anti-propaganda for against the space fascists, and that truly turns the people of Earth against them. This film writes itself, buddy. This is. This is, uh, it's halfway there already. We just need a producer. Uh, Mm -hmm. And Ben, are you, I mean, there are no guarantees of getting back to now. You seem to be suggesting that you're kind of cool with that. Um, I mean, it's not the best time in history, is it? (laughs) I don't know that there's, uh, I I feel like, you know, hopefully in the future they have like better medicine and stuff. Yeah, um, you know everything seems to be. Cr- I'd be interested you, you to could see. You sort of how make a fresh start in the future. Yeah, definitely. Um, Brilliant. Well, do, yeah, do you think you would tell anyone that you're going? You know, would you contact anyone? <laughs> yeah, I probably probably should, shouldn't I? That would. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I'm. I'm quite uncommunicative. Uh, with most of my friends and family. So I'm quite bad at answering texts. So I do think that maybe if I did go away for like four days or something, um, people would probably be like, eh, he's, <laughs> he's probably just got lost on a walk or something. Or he's, you know, <laughs> he's trying to do a gig in Coventry. And, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and lastly, you know, but not leastly, do you think you would be disappointed to return to the present time? Say you avert whatever catastrophe in the future, would you feel kind of used and, and sort of disregarded if they kind of said, all right, thanks very much, back to 2020 you go? Um, or do you kind of think you would want to stick around and enjoy the adulation of saving the world in the future? Ooh, that's a that's a, a tough one. Um, Well, I mean, it depends on your time space logic doesn't it because if i if if i go back then i'm still gonna be the guy who saves the the world eventually and that i will be the person who comes back to get me so i i'm still gonna receive that adulation but as older me eventually i don't don't think there's anything wrong in waiting Mm. um uh also it's quite nice to you know, it's like the classic thing, isn't it? Everyone always says, oh, it'd be great to be, you know, go back and be a teenager. But with all the stuff that I know now, I could be a, such a, or, a, you know, go back to university or whatever. I'd be such a cool, interesting person if I knew all the stuff that I know now and didn't make all those stupid mistakes. Yeah. Um, so I could, you know, I could mm-hmm. legitimately do that. I could be like, I know what the future holds um, and I know what I'm going to be like and I can, you know, but... It sounds also like it would really help you through some of those kind of, you know, a night where you come off stage and you kind of think that that didn't go quite as well as I would have liked. To sure. Do, yeah. But at least I'm going to save the world in 14 years. Yeah, know? exactly. It sounds yeah, like it would be a real security blanket. That's it. It's like it's when you got like a package coming in like three weeks or something. You're like, there's a tick in the box in the, <laughs> you know, on the calendar a few days away. This is this has all got to happen. It's a safety net. Yeah. Very nice. <laughs> well, that sounds fantastic. I, I really hope that this comes to pass. And, and please do tell me in the future if if future you does burst through the door, because that would make me feel good having oh, sure. predicted it. 
But I would um, I would think that you had 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 predicted. I would have thought that future you had come back and told you that it would happen. In fact, <gasps> if you would, I'm get I'm confusing myself now. This is <laughs> I shouldn't have embarked upon this meta narrative. <laughs> I'm now worried that future me is the one that has instigated this crisis that's put the world in danger. Yeah, maybe you're the villain of the piece. Oh, that's dreadful. Uh, oh, I'm so disappointed at how this yeah. turned out. It is, I mean, it is weird that you knew all about it. <laughs> of course, who else could know about it other than the person whose fault it was? Right, right. Ah, and what a mistake I've apparently made in warning you that this is going to happen and yeah. that you're the person to save the world. I mean, I've made mistakes here. Not good. <laughs> you've, you've, you've really pre prepped me for this. <laughs> I really have. Ben, uh, before you go and before we finish up, uh, is there anything that you would like to kind of uh, promote or recommend to our listeners? How can we stay in touch with you? Uh, how do we get the full Ben Pope experience? Oh God, there's not much of an experience currently to experience. Um, uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Ben W Pope. Um, I have, if you want to watch some of my stand up, then if you go to my coffee page, which is kofi.com slash Ben Pope, um, you can watch some of my stand up. Um, and if you want to, you can donate a coffee to me, which is just sending me three pounds. Um, Brilliant. Other than that, I don't have an enormous amount to promote other than uh, people should try as best they can to save live comedy. Please donate. If you have a comedy yeah. club in your local area, such as Jericho Comedy, donate to it. They'll almost certainly have like a, a scheme. Um, so do that. There's a currently a petition um, that you can sign an open letter, in fact, uh, on the Live Comedy Association's website, in which you can uh, sign an open letter to the government or to the Arts Council, I think it is, to provide funding for uh, live comedy because uh, it's in a real state right now and 75% of all the comedy clubs may close by the end yeah. of the year uh, without any option of coming back. So please, please do that if you can. Um, I'm really not the person to donate to at the moment. Live comedy is. <clears throat> oh, that's wonderful. Thank you, Ben. Well, we'll we'll link to that open letter, uh, and to your your YouTube and your Kofi and uh, and your Twitter. Uh, we will make sure that people can stay across uh, all of your things, and uh, we very very much look forward to having you back at Jericho Comedy as soon as possible because we really oh, love. Oh, thanks, having man. You. It's always a pleasure. Uh, ben, thank you so much for giving up your time to be on the podcast. Uh, can't wait to see you again soon. Yeah, you too, man. Thank you so much for having me. What a dream. Cheers, Ben. Bye bye. Bye. Well, there we have it. That was the fantastic Ben Pope. I loved chatting with him. As Ben said, like so many sections of the arts, live comedy is going through a bit of a difficult patch. But unlike many other art forms like uh, theatre, music, and dance, comedy is getting no support from the government. And this will inevitably lead to the closure of comedy venues and comedy clubs if action isn't taken. So please do, as Ben said, sign the open letter to the government to save live comedy. We'll include the link in the episode description. And if you can, throw a bit of money at a comedy club. I mean, don't mean throw money, you know, donate money online in a safe, non-aggressive way. And if you have money burning a hole in your pocket, you can also donate to our fantastic charity partner, Oxfordshire Mind. We've raised over £70,000 in the last few years for Oxford Your Mind, and we'd really love to keep that total going up. And all the info you need to donate is in the podcast description. Please do like, subscribe, give five stars, share, all that stuff. It's a new podcast that we're really proud of, and we'd love as many of our brilliant Jericho audiences to enjoy it as possible. We're on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Anchor, Google Podcasts, YouTube, SoundCloud. So spread the podcast far and spread it wide. Thanks so much for tuning in. We'll be back with another episode next week, but until then, bye-bye.